Well, greetings, Oakwood. Today I'm here with my son, Christian. You all know him. So last Sunday, I preached from Psalms 27, verses 4 to verses 6. Um, now, I had two points under that. And under the second point, I had four points. So Christian today is going to refresh us and tell me what those two points were from last week. Or commitment to the Lord provides hope. Or comfort in the Lord provides hope. Okay, good. So under that second point, our comfort in the Lord provides hope, I had four points. What are those four points? God has a shel sheltered place for us. God has a secret place for us. God has a secure place for us. God has a special place for us. Okay, so this week I am going to be speaking from Psalms 27, verses 7 to verses 10. And I'm going to read it, okay? All right. So, Oakwood, if you have your Bible, open it to Psalms 27, verses 7 to verses 10. And the scripture reads, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, I do seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my, my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. So last week Hannah sung, and you have a song? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to do one verse? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's hear it. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say the Lord. Now my best of by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Amen. Oh, good job. Stay back to open. Good boy. The celebration of the first half of Psalms, verses 1 to verses 6, might make us think that it was all easy for David. One might think that when trouble came, there was no struggle, either with self or with God. Yet, David shows us that even he, the one who sought God with such passion, sometimes felt like God did not hear him immediately. And that's like us sometimes. When we, when we pray to God, we often feel like God is not listening. And I think this is why some people often stop praying, because they feel that God is not listening, listening. like God is distant. God is not present with them in their situation. So they default to not praying at all, and just taking the victim role that God wants nothing to do with me. But we must understand and never forget that fear lives right next door to faith. Let me say that again. Fear lives right next door to faith. Those who have a problem and who are facing it right now hardly need to be reminded of that. We ride the roller coaster from faith to fear over and over again. One moment we say everything is going to work out fine, we feel confident, we feel victorious. The next moment we are looking at our circumstances in absolute despair. And I don't know about you, but I am one person that hates roller coasters. I hate the feeling of the rush going down and then going up and preparing to go down again. Some of you like it. You are into the adrenaline rush. It, it, it uh, motivates you. You go from ride to ride. I will go to an amusement, amusement park and sit down and watch everybody else enjoy it. That ain't fun to me. But sometimes that is just like life. Um, there's all these ups and there's a lot of downs and they go really fast. And it's like sometimes the ups come slowly, but the downs come really fast. That is life. We move from fear to faith, and we bounce back and forth between the two. But how did David handle the situation when he found himself at the bottom of the mountain? What did David do? 
Well, listen to David's words in verse 7. He says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Listen, church. David had hope and assurance that God will answer his prayers because all of this thinking of David was based on God's mercy. So David believed that God would answer his prayer based on God's mercy. Once again, how did he know God's mercy? How did David understand the mercy of God? Because he had spent time gazing upon God's beauty. Remember, I spoke about that last week. He was fixated on the beauty of God, which are his attributes. When you know God, truly know God, your prayer life will be transformed. The more you know him, the more you will love him. And the more you love him, the more you will want to know him. This cycle will be part of the divine rhythm of heaven. Beholding God's beauty, knowing and loving, and loving and knowing. That, that, that's important. It's a cycle that goes around. You want to know God, you love God. You love God, you want to know him more. And just keep spinning like that. But, but notice David's deep humility. He was deeply aware that in coming before God, he needed God's mercy. And we all do. We must come humbly before God. Prayer is many things. It's communication. It's relationship. It's request. But central to any definition of prayer is the concept of dependence. At bottom line, prayer is dependence. We are totally dependent upon God. But it takes humility to admit that. And some people's pride keep them far away from God. They don't come to God humbly. So David calls upon God's mercy. Look what David says. Be gracious to me and answer me. David didn't say, answer me because I'm such a good person. I deserve it. In fact, in verse 9, David gives an implied confession of sin when he asks the Lord not to turn away in anger. Now, we have to thank God, like Psalms 133 says, if God should count iniquities, who would stand? Think about that. We should thank God that he, that he doesn't count it, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we receive forgiveness of sins, because if God were to count all of our sins, all of our iniquities, everything that did, we did wrong, we would not be able to stand. You have to make that soak in. Many of us have the perception that we are good people. I often hear people say that, well, you know, I'm not a bad person. Well, who determines that? Who determines that you are not a bad person? Are you comparing yourself to somebody else? Because the Bible says that all have sinned and far fall short of God's glory. The Bible says that we have all gone astray. So this idea of we're not um, uh, bad people, uh, I question that. Uh, I think the very opposite. We are all depraved people. We are more prone to sin than going towards God. That's what the scripture says again. No one seeks God. So if it was not for what Jesus did, none of us can stand. So the only way to approach God is through his abundant grace and his mercy as shown in the Lord Jesus Christ. But look what David says. He says, answer me. This is interesting because in prayer, we should expect answers. To you, that may sound obvious, but how uh, often do we pray but don't expect God to answer? especially when the answer is delayed for years. You see, a lot of us get discouraged. We go on our knees and uh, we pray and we don't hear from God. And then we, we don't want anything to do with God because of that. But we don't realize that God 
when you pray, it could say to you, yes, he could say no, or he could say, wait. You know, it's sometimes it's in the waiting time that God has us, that he builds us, that he molds us, and that he makes us into his image. And our responsibility is to constantly go to God and get a greater perspective of God. But well, we could only do that through, through prayer. So we should be surprised when the Lord does, doesn't answer prayer. You hear me? We should be surprised when the Lord doesn't answer prayer, not when he does, because God does answer prayer. The issue is you may not be willing to want to hear his response. But you have to trust that God is all-knowing and that he knows the end from the beginning. So you must trust whatever answer he gives to you. But look at verse 8. It says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. If somebody were to ask, what is the secret to a good life? This would be my answer. The secret to thriving in an otherwise unstable, unpredictable, hostile world would be seeking stability and comfort and riches in God, not in this world. We do not seek stability or comfort or riches or security in this world. Not at all. We seek it in God. We seek Him. We seek God Himself. You know, it's interesting how I have decided that I'm not going to watch too much of the politics because it's kind of too dramatic for me. You have you always have opposing sides to argument. You know, dare you, like Donald Trump, those who don't don't want to talk to you, even in the church, or if you're conservative and, or if you're you're liberal. There's this this fight of political sides. But the reality, we as Christians, we side with God. That's period. We're not for no political party. We are on the side of the Almighty. So in the end, God controls the circumstances. So as we have Antifa and riots and places going upside down, guess what our stability is? It's in God. And we can look at these circumstances. We can look at these political arenas and these fights that are happening. We can look at these burning and these riots and say, that's what you get with a life without God. But stability is found in those who seek God. So seek him. Seek God himself. Look at what Psalms 34 and verse 4 says. It says, I thought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. So are you afraid of what is happening in this world? Are you concerned about the political climate? Are you concerned about the economy? Well, I got an answer for you. Seek the Lord, and he will deliver you from all your fears. Because as I said, you will get a bigger vision of God. God will become that much bigger. Okay, so verses 8. Verses 8 is the heart of the message. Now, in the ancient world, before the printing press or before you could order books online or go to a bookstore, people had to be much more attentive listeners. They knew instinctively when they were at the center of a passage of scripture or of a message. And they knew that the lesson to be learned was there. It's always in the middle. And here in Psalms 27, as though purposely tucked in the middle, waiting to be found uh, by those who are diligent and observant, we find this verse. Seek my face. My heart said to you, your face, O Lord, shall I seek. God speaks to our hearts, and then our hearts speak to us. God places the desire in our heart to seek his face, his presence. But we must make the, the willing determination to follow through. Don't take that desire for granted that God places in your heart. When your heart calls 
to you to seek God in prayer, rejoice. Listen to your heart. You are at a point of spiritual sensitivity in your life. Don't take it for granted. Don't assume that you will be at the same point of receptivity tomorrow. My heart says to you, seek my face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Seek God, the scripture says, while he may be found. This is a precious nugget we're supposed to take away from this message. God is saying to you, seek my face, seek my presence. So let your heart respond obediently and say, your face, your presence, O oh Lord, I will seek. And let me ask you, are you there? Are you there in your life? Are you saying, God, I want to seek your face? I want to seek your presence? Or do you just want answers to solutions? Do you just want to get rid of your problems? Do you not want to be in the circumstances that you're in? Or do you truly, honestly, wholeheartedly want to seek God's face? I find it very interesting. In verse 8, David says that he's going to seek the face of God. Now when you turn to verses 9, it says, David says to the Lord, Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. So God tells David to seek his face. David says he will see God's face. Now he's saying that, um, hide not your face from me. Now, of course, God never leaves us nor forsakes us. We see that in Scripture. It's over and over in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But sometimes we have to be honest. It may seem like he does. It may seem like God is nowhere to be found. And even worse, everywhere we turn in Scripture, we seem to find just the angry passages the dire warnings, the pages overcast with justice and, and God's wrath. And even worse, then Christian fellowship seems to fail. Those we love in the Lord let us down. The pressure of life and its problems abound as never before. We pray and nothing happens. How many of us could say that? Even worse, we have no desire to pray. God seems to have withdrawn his um, presence. His, he seems to be high in heaven, and we seem to be left to ourselves. That's a sad reality and state some of us are in, if you care to be honest and to admit. David had the feeling that he had been rejected by his Father in heaven. How many of you can say that? How many of you have felt the same way that somehow you have been rejected by God? It is like God cares about other people's concerns. God seems to be other, answering other people's prayer, but he seems to be absent from you. That's a real experience. And we have to be honest. And David is honest. David is, David is very honest in what he is saying here. But notice verses 10. Verse 10 reads, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Now, we do not know what prompted this statement. But we do know that there was a time when David was in the cave of Abdullah. And at this time, Saul's persecution became more intense that David felt for his parents' safety. So what he did was remove them from their farm and bring them to safety in the cave. But even this large cave would not be safe enough for them. So David approached the king of Moab with the request that his parents be allowed political asylum down there. After all, Jesse's grandmother was a woman of Moab. So in a sense, the family would be coming for um, a visit to their ancestral home. If you want to know more about this situation, look at uh, 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 to 3. 
So incidentally, this is the last historical reference we have to David's parents. We never read of them coming back as we assume that they probably died there. So perhaps David had just heard of their death in Moab. Perhaps his parents were not understanding about David's difficulties and reproached him for the loss of their, their farm. We don't know. Maybe they were upset for the hardship of their old age that they had to endure. Um, maybe they were upset at um, their exile in Moab. Uh, Moab. We, don't, we don't know. All we know is that David had a feeling of being forsaken by his family. Look at what it says. When my, my, when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me in. When Israel marched through the desert in the days of Exodus, God provided a regard, which is a part of a military force that protects um, them from the back end of an attack. Its, its duty was to pick up the stragglers, the weak, the children, the old folks, and carry them forward with the rest of the group. Now, I could imagine that David felt like one of those stragglers. He had fallen by the wayside, and he prayed that God would play the part of the regard to him and tenderly, lovingly pick him up. This, of course, is just what God delights to do. He loves to be the good Samaritan. He will indeed pick up us when we are kneeling, when we are, we are forsaken by everybody, and he will gather us in his arms. That, that's who God is. Some people are rejected by their fathers. Other people have been rejected by their mothers. But David is saying, my mother and my father have forsaken me. The Lord will take me in. Or the another verse says it. Even if my mother and my father reject me, God will receive me up. You know, that word receive here means to take care of. There's a, a man by the name of John Trapp, and he translates this verse, the Lord will take me into his care and into his keeping. Isn't that powerful? that the Lord will take us into his care and in the, into his keeping, that God will be in a sense of rear guard, picking up the stragglers and moving them along with the group. That's what he will do for us. But in this context, this whole word of, of um, receive um, could almost mean the same as adopt. Though, though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will adopt me. Isn't that good? When even those closest to you fail you, when people betray you, when people turn their backs against you, let me ask you, to whom will you turn? Well, listen to me. God will receive you. God himself will take you in. And that's what David is saying in, in this passage, that seek God's face. Seek him. You diligently seek him because he's calling for you to seek him. And understand this, that God will adopt you. God will take care of you. He will keep you. God will tend you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that powerful that we have a God that will do all of this for us? I think that's what we need to know. People uh, like us are sinners. We are failures. We, we fail God. We, we are on the weak side of things. When problems happen, we break down. Uh, we are filled with fear. We are filled with regret over our life or our, over our past. We are, we are filled with sin. But if we seek God and go towards him, God will adopt you. I think that's, that's powerful. Well, Oko, that is your lesson uh, for today. Remember that. Remember that you are to seek the face of God, and God will take you in, even if everybody else turns their back on you, 
you have hope that God will take you in. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are such a good God, that you are great to us, that you are loving, that you are merciful, that uh, you see us for who we are. We are wretched, poor, broken people, but you love us. And you always provide protection for your people. So, Lord, we come to you now and we ask you to cover us and strengthen us to seek you and let us know that as much as failures as we are, oh God, you will adopt us. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord be with you again, Uncle. See you next week.